Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is filmmaker Florian Henkel von Donnersmark. His new film, Never Look Away, has been shortlisted for the 2019 Oscars in the foreign films category. In 2007, Mr. Donnersmark's feature film, which was his debut feature film, The Other Lives, won him his first Academy Award. Here's a clip from his new film, Never Look Away, and then our interview with Mr. Donnersmark. Nie wegsehen, Gott. Alles, was war, ist schön. Arbeitet an eurem Handwerk in den Dienst am Volk. Hilft das dem Arbeiter? Glaub mir, es stimmt alles nicht, was ich da gemalt habe. Dein Schwiegervater? Das ist nicht die Erbmasse, die ich unseren Nachkommen wünsche. Kann er uns nicht einfach in Ruhe lassen? Boah. Indem ihr euch frei macht, macht ihr die Welt frei. Nur der Künstler kann den Menschen nach dieser Katastrophe das Gespür für ihre Freiheit zurückgeben. Ich war klein. Mein Arzt soll doch heilen. Er soll doch heilen. Welcome, Florian, to San Francisco. Thank you, Kamala. I'm very happy to be here. Have you been to San Francisco before? Oh, yes, yes, many times. Um, you know, I mean, it's one of the, one of the centers of uh, the Western world. So, uh, I, I, you know, I've been here to present all my films. I've also been here once with uh, with my brother uh, when um, uh, when when we were touring the U.S. And then actually, I was once here just as a babysitter for my own children when I was accompanying my wife, who used to work with um, with a professor at uh, Stanford and uh, who lived in San Francisco, uh, Lawrence Lessig, and uh, who's now at Harvard. Yeah, exactly. Who's now at Harvard? Very good. You were truly <laughs> well informed. So he was. Uh, she she was running the international side of his Creative Commons enterprise, and uh, and so we were here a lot. And uh, and and at that time, uh, m my my films hadn't done well enough yet for me to be able to afford a babysitter. So I was the babysitter, and I came along as her babysitter, looking after after the children, which still had to be nursed or something at that point. <laughs> was this be before uh, your second film, The Tourist, or after? No, this was, this was before The Lives of Others shortly. Or I think we just, I think I'd already written The Lives of Others, but we were still trying to raise the financing, or, or, it hadn't, or we were still kind of editing it, and it wasn't known yet that it would really, you know, that it would do pretty well. Okay. <laughs> so Never Look Away is your third film. Your mm -hmm. first film was uh, The Other Lives, mm -hmm. for which you won uh, an Oscar mm -hmm. for the best foreign mm -hmm. film. Your second film was The Tourist, mm -hmm. which was such a huge, I mean, you basically flipped. <laughs> you know, you, you went from making a film on the Star Sea mm -hmm. to making this very glamorous film with mm -hmm. Angelina Jolie and Johnny Depp. Yeah. And I read somewhere that you spent two days perfecting her lipstick and dress color. You know what? Yeah, I, I wonder if it was just two days. Could have been more than that. <laughs> I mean, you know, these these little things really matter immensely. And uh, you know, I think why? I mean, we, uh, why? Why did you get this obsession for details? You know, I, I I think that's something that you're probably born with. Uh, you know that, but it might also have to do. You know, now that you're asking. Um, I mean, I, I I grew up with a very critical mother. Everything had to be just so. And uh, I think that's something you just um, take over. And I think it's something, you know, being a director is one of the few fields where that is actually a useful thing to, to have, a useful characteristic, you know, because, uh, of course, it improves the film if everything is just so. And, um, you know, yes, the, the lipstick or, you know, her gait, her walk, um, or, you know, I don't know, the exact way that a dress flows or all those things. I mean, that's very important in a film that's all about, you know, elegance and beauty. Um, so I'm sure I spent uh, days on that. You know, if, if she said two days, she was probably understating it. It's, uh, it's also, it, for, for example, the translation of colors from, uh, the translation of colors f from reality to film 
is something that has to be examined very closely because, I mean, you know, a, a lipstick matches a certain complexion and so on, but of course through a chemical process or also a digital process that color changes. So you have to, tr you have to, you, you can't just decide on something based on looking at it, you have to see it on film. So do you do lots mm -hmm. of, uh, do you do a lot of uh, tweaking in post-production? Uh, yes, I mean I, I do tweaking everywhere. I mean that's that's the thing. You see, I'm I'm constantly directing. You know, I'm I'm rearranging in my mind this room as to how it would be a better studio for you to shoot it. And, you know, so it's something I can't shut down that voice. You know, I walk through a street and I'm rebuilding the city, and so it's kind of you know in a way less exhausting to me to be on a set where I can actually change those things. So it's not just my mind uh, spinning and not being able to do anything about it. You know? So you're a visual <laughs> thinker. Um, yeah, but I mean, it applies in the same way to language or to, um, or, to, or to concepts or to the way that people tell stories. You know, I mean, it, it drives me crazy when people tell jokes and, you know, mm, mess up the punchline, but you know, somehow every form of dialogue can be like that. <laughs> so in the movies, I get the chance to get it all right uh, for, the, for the length of the movie. How did you come up with the title, Never Look Away? So... The, I've heard all your stories for your film about <laughs> the, the other lives where you, Lenin heard this Beethoven uh, uh, piece of music and that's how you got your hook because he said, if I listen to the music, and for this I've heard you talk about Elia Kazan. Mm -hmm. But how did you really come up with the... the just the Never Look Away? Um, I mean, it's... So the the artist that uh, who's on whose life the movie is based a little bit, I mean, lots of other influences too, and a lot of fiction, but is Gerhard Richter, the great German painter, and he has this belief in something which, when he describes it, you'd say he's describing coincidence, chance, you know. But um, but he's uh, and 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 the beauty that this all the things that are you know kind of coincidental. Uh, just can just be on by virtue of being real, they are beautiful, and it's it's a very complicated philosophy. I'm not sure I've fully understood it yet, but it can be boiled down in a very simple way to um, everything that is uh, true has some kind of beauty, and. Um, and, you know, so, of course, that begs the question, you know, think of all the terrible crimes that were committed, uh, especially the crimes committed by Germany in the 20th century. How can you, you know, even talk of beauty in that context? So, you know, in a way, you have to now define what is beauty. But in any case, even if it's not true, and Keats wrote a whole pe poem called The Ode to the Grecian Urn and so on, which explores that subject matter and um, I mean he was both um, praised and attacked to the present day for that poem but certainly you realize it's something worth think thinking about and if you say that it's something worth thinking about it's something worth examining at all times and so you know it's worth always looking at everything because you're constantly on the search for truth or beauty or both or that thing which both of those things represent uh, and, so, and it also comes out of hurt, and it comes out of. Uh, it's also, you know, it's so bad it carries, memories. Yes, it carries that connotation. It also ca carries the connotation that um, you know we shouldn't make it so easy for a a criminal uh, by just looking away and not acknowledging their crimes. You know, if if everybody always looks very carefully at what's happening, you know, I think we could prevent a lot of terrible things from happening just through that. I think it's also a great way of saying. Don't you know? Question your judgment at all times. Don't be prejudiced. You know, even if you think you know something, still never look away, and try and see if you, if if you don't have to evaluate, reevaluate what you what, what you're thinking is at all times. I, I I try and remind myself of that often. You know, I you have to go back to the basics and always ask yourself, Am I really? Is there a reason why I believe this? Because we are incredibly heedless in the formation of our beliefs. And at the same time, 
if somebody challenges our beliefs, we defend them as if we'd been born with them and they're part of our very DNA. You know, so you know that that's also then contained in the in the um, in the never look away. You know, so it's don't look away from injustice, don't look away from what you think you know is true, don't look away from something that you think might be ugly and might be true just for the sake of um, uh, you know just because it's it's because it is something authentic. You know, it, ha it, it has a lot of meanings, and I like that. I like titles that don't So it's a very layered... Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, you can think about it for a long time, kind of like, like, a work of, uh, uh, like, a, like a work of art in a museum. You look at it, it looks deceptively simple, but you can spend, stand in front of that work of art and think about it for hours, days, and, and months, and I, 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 I like a title to be the same thing. <laughs> Your answer gave birth to three questions. One okay. is on John Keats, the other is on the lead motif in the film, where the kid never looks away. You know, so you yes. have the direct gaze of the kid. Yeah. And the third is a question on ideology. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask about John Keats. So the, the Keats poem that you said is Ode on a Grecian Urn, mm -hmm. 200 years old. Mm. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Mm -hmm. So that's what informed you. It didn't really inform me. I, I, I'm sure I'd read it at some point, um, and it was really only when I was working with the genius composer in England, Max, oh, Richter, Max Richter, yeah, um, that he said, uh, that's Keats. And I said, well, what do you mean, when we got to that point? And he said, uh, and then he quoted to me by memory the, uh, the, the Grecian urn. And I thought, oh, yes, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I read that at some point. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it had... Um, there's, there's a strong overlap between Keats's philosophy there, expressed as a very young man, and you know, kind of a philosophy that gave birth to a, kind, a certain type of English romanticism, and, um, and Gerhard Richter's philosophy, who in some way is romantic in his own right. Uh, he, he, uh, he sees as his main forefather in painting Caspar David Friedrich, the great German romantic painter, and there is a certain continuity there. So, uh, I mean, uh, um, you know, I'm there are a lot of interlocking uh, yes, ideas yes. there. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the question of ideology. So your first film, The Other Lives, you know, you looked at the communist ideology in mm -hmm. one way. That is one way of saying. And then I read somewhere that you stopped. The film ends when Gorbachev got, got elected. Oh yes, yes. And this film. You again look at ideology, but in very interesting ways, mm -hmm. and you look through uh, ideology through art. So you're mm -hmm. looking at World War II, the Nazi ideology. Then you're looking at what happened to Germany when it got divided. Mm -hmm. Then you're looking at ideology of this young artist mm -hmm. who then finds freedom go and goes to West Germany. Mm -hmm. And yet he is held back by the ideology of his childhood. Yes, I think that's very true. The yeah. two, the, what he saw under Nazi Germany yes. and what he saw in East Germany. Yeah, it's so it's so hard to break free, isn't it, from the things that we were shaped, uh, to, from from what we were shaped to be. You know, so so the Nazis maybe recognized talent in this young boy, wanted him to perpetuate their Social. ideology through his art, their agenda, exactly. And then, uh, and then the communists, you know, wanted him to paint um, pictures that would inspire the worker to do great work in the name of socialism. And, uh, Why and the he, fascination with ideology? What is it about that part of German history? Because you're touching yeah. three different eras. Yes. And you've got three different characters who are each embedded in that era. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that um, ideology, any form of political extremism, is something which is, it's almost like a programming error in the, in the, in the human structure that we are so susceptible to ideology. And it is something that brings us away from from humanity, you know, from our own humanity. So it is something that is so cr incredibly attractive to us for some reason, you know. And I mean, these can be all kinds of different ideology. I mean, you know, extreme, you know, any any type of political extremism is is an ideology. And um, I, I I think um, I think that the greatest weapon that we have against political extremism, and against ideology, is art. Um, and that is why I thought it would be very interesting to track this artist who was shaped by the Nazis, shaped by the communists, then comes to the West and suddenly you know, is free and confused. What do you do with complete freedom? I mean, that's, a, that's, 
uh, it, it's scary if you've been a slave all your life, you know, to suddenly be free. And so he looks and sees, okay, what's the dominant ideology? And it might be, you know, the market or what's cool at this given moment in art. And so he starts embarking on that path first and he realizes this isn't it. You know, I have to look for it within and manages to free himself completely from, from, from the way he has been shaped and just finds it within himself and through that can help others with his art. You know? And I think that's in a way a, a journey that we all have to embark on. You know, I, I think we've... Uh, he doesn't shy away from the truth and he brings the truth in his own way. Yes, yes. With I mean, that collage. He, that he, trust, he, trusts his, um, he trusts his instinct, his feeling. He knows that you know, it's maybe not something that he, can, that he can discover just by reason, but he listens to that little inner voice inside him which, uh, you know, and, 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 and so finds his, finds his own center. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the elements of the film that are inspired by uh, Mr. Gerard uh, uh, Richter, mm -hmm. the artist, mm -hmm. who also didn't know that his own wife's father Yes. Had was, played uh, a role uh, during yeah, the Nazi was, regime. Was, was really one of the leading SS doctors and, uh, and, a, and a truly terrible figure uh, who only uh, died in 1988, uh, never brought to justice. He died at age, I think, 94. Uh, as many of the you know, criminals of any system, but you know, also of Nazi Germany, were never brought to justice. Um, but I think that we have to, I think we have to look at it in a way that doesn't destroy us. If we, you know, as a, as a child, it always used to drive me crazy, crazy, this thought that, you know, growing up in Germany, there were people around me that I believed had been Nazis and, you know, had never been punished and I was suspecting everybody and so on. And, you know, at some point you realize that's, it's not a healthy way to live. Um, so was it very confusing to, to grow up that way? Well, I mean, it was just, it was something, it just, I mean, it was an obsession of my mother's, this kind of injustice. And uh, so she raised us very much in that spirit. I mean, she'd been, she was very active in the socialist youth movement. You know, for a long time in the movie, I think you will want this guy to just be brought to justice. And I think that what, what keeps us going, when will that be discovered? In the end, you realize that, hopefully, um, that... It's more about where is the artist going? What, how, you know, what is his inner development? Is that not so much more important? You know, so those are the two trajectories in a way of this film. So you wrote the screenplay too. You yes. wrote the story. Mm -hmm. So how long did it take for you to write this? So I, I, have, I have an arbitrary rule for myself there because I, you know, it's, um, I know from the lives of others that I can spend you know, as long as anyone will give me. I, I will spend as much time until I run out of my last dime to write a screenplay because you know you can always improve on a screenplay you know I could and uh, so I've set an arbitrary rule for myself that I said okay as long as it takes for one human to make another human nine months oh. that's the maximum that I'm going to spend so on actually writing for nine months. exactly so what were the feelings you were trying to evoke in us through never look away well I mean you know maybe maybe a love of uh, freedom, you know, um, because it's about one man's and one woman's uh, quest for freedom, breaking free from the systems they were raised in, breaking free from ideology, breaking free from fashion, you know, dictating what type of art you're supposed to make, breaking free from the judgment of others, you know, and... Um, and just finding themselves, you know. I mean, that's that's the most important uh, task and challenge that we face in life, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I'm going to end uh, with this line that is from the film, mm -hmm. which is, I think, one of the final lines in the film, mm. when the artist finally uh, is recognized and he's having a press meeting and people want to know what his art is all about. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm not making statements, I'm making pictures. Mm -hmm. How much of it came from you because... This is you writing the dialogue. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think that the same goes for, for the artist who's making the pictures. At the end of the day, of course, those pictures will show us very clearly who he is and what he believes. Uh, and so I really try and follow my feeling for what is a great story. And then 
part of the fun is trying to figure out why I wanted to make, why I wanted to tell that story, why I think that it is so great. You know, it's not that I say, oh, you know what, let's make a let's make a film about overcoming ideology or something like that. That would be a very difficult thing to do. You know, I, I, I find this, this, this story, it speaks to me. I find it exciting, and I know I won't get bored during the, in this case, four years of making the movie. And part of the fun is to see, hey, wh why do I never find this boring? What's so exciting about it? How does it have to do with my life? And that journey of self-discovery is what, uh, what makes... Uh, what I think make, makes our profession so interesting. I'm sure it's the same for you. You know, you choose a subject and uh, you try and find out why do I find this interesting, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so the movie uh, I, I, is perhaps in a way uh, it's a metaphor I, I, it's at so many levels, but it's also did you tell yourself? And I just was wondering aloud that don't look away from the history of Germany from the 1930s all the way up to the 1960s. You have yes. to go and take a look at it, yes. but look at it through the prism of art. Yes, I mean, I, I, I'd say that's, that's fair. I was always, um, you know, fascinated and horrified as I think everybody in our generation, you know, to be growing up in a country where these awful crimes had been committed in the name of that very country. Did you see the wall coming up? Um, no, that was before my time. But um, but you know, I saw it there. Um, you know, I, I, I lived with it. Uh, you know, every day. Uh, I, I we moved to Berlin in 1981, and the wall was there all the time. But twenty uh, years. Yeah, it, exactly. So so it was uh, it was it was an everyday reality. But you know, it's 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 just that, in a way, as as Germans, we're in a unique position, for a very sad reason. But to, to tell the, the 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 crazy story of the 20th century, because all the madness of the uh, of the 20th century happened in Germany in an intensified form. You know, the whole world was divided into two blocks. Um, Germany was divided into two parts. There was even a city within Germany that was divided into two parts again. So, you know, it was all intensified and compounded. And uh, I, you know, and, and, and ideology was lived through in the most extreme form. And it was always very interesting to me to try and find out how was that possible? You know, how could that happen? And it really left me no peace. And, uh, and I felt that a lot of the, um, Often the way that it was portrayed in films and in books and in history lessons, for that matter, was not very helpful, because if things were as 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 clear and as um, as if the injustice were that clearly visible at all times, then everybody would have been in the resistance, you know, and and then and and I even think that you know in a way portraying these these incredibly evil people as if they were, you know, had basically appeared like devils, you know, um, almost makes it too easy for something like that to happen again. Because people say, well, if something like that happens, like I see it in that movies, you know, sure, I'll be on the right side of all that. But it's much more insidious. It's much more seductive. It's much, um, much more hidden. It the, just creeps up on you. Yeah. And so I really tried, I, I really tried throughout my whole life to understand that. How could these things happen? And, um, and, and so, in a way, just because I spent so much of my life looking into that, I, I hope that the subjects that I'm drawn to will help me sculpt films that help prevent something like that from ever happening again. What's next for you? There's a very beautiful novel that I optioned called Everything Matters by a, a wonderful writer from Maine, a young writer called... Maine, um, uh, USA? Yes, Maine, USA. And um, it's a beautiful end of times uh, story, very poetic uh, and very philosophical. And, and it's, I mean, it's a huge novel. I could turn it into five miniseries, but I think that it could make, um, if there's, there's one section of, the, of that book that I'd like to uh, possibly turn into, um, into a movie if, if, 
in a way, the world of independent cinema isn't dead by then. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the type of films that uh, shaped us are, are, are dying out. You know, there's, there, there will always be the world of very, very little indie films, you know, shot in 30 days and uh, made for $2 million, you know, but that's, that's not my type of movie because I do like to sculpt things till they're just right. You know, I, I, I do like to have time to work with the actors to get great performances. I love, I love the right lipstick color and like spending two days on finding it, you know. Uh, I, 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 I do think those things matter and I, I love it. I love going into a movie theater and having a luxurious experience. You know, that's, uh, that's it's, it's one of the great things, especially if it deals with challenging, uh, complicated matters. You know, I, I mean, it, of course, it's fun to, to have a luxurious experience when you go and see a superhero film also, but that's not what I mean. I love it when, uh, yeah, when a film deals with, for instance, you know, the path of an artist, and I don't feel like it was um, made on a shoestring budget and... Uh, I kind of know that I can't expect something very spectacular because it would have been too expensive for them to make it. So, but I don't know if that type of movie, the you want um, that experience. Yes, I don't know if the, the joy of experiencing yeah. a film. Yeah, it's uh, I I don't know if the kind of Billy Wilder, Alfred Hitchcock. You, know, um, you just Peter told those names from my <laughs> mouth. I was going to ask yeah. you whether you had Billy Wilder and Alfred Hitchcock in your Yeah, mind. I mean, I'm just thinking th th those are the people who, who, who discovered the film grammar, mm. you know, the grammar that we're all using uh, today. And so it's, it's not, I don't think they invented it. I really think that they discovered something that they, they found a way how to use a sequence of images that goes directly into our they soul. They enthralled us. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just... You know, and, and people continued it. I mean, David Lean continued that, or someone like Peter Weir, or, um, you know, and, and, and it is a beautifully established grammar that, of course, continues to evolve as technology evolves. You know, I always stay very much abreast of the, you know, what technology makes possible for us. But um, it is also a grammar that needs a certain uh, budget. You know, you cannot make a movie like Titanic on a... Um, on a shoestring budget, you just can't. Uh, and the fact that that film is so beautiful and powerful uh, is because you, you, you feel that it does all the pirouettes that it wants to do. And, uh, and, and it might be that that type of storytelling is migrating into, onto the small screen and to Netflix and Amazon world. And you know if, if that's how it's gonna be, then so be it, but I'm not quite ready to give up the big screen experience yet. <laughs> well, thank you for not giving yeah. up. <laughs> okay. thank, you, thank you for thank not you, giving up. <laughs> Florian, it was such a pleasure to talk a to great you. Great pleasure for me, thank you. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time. And if you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our website. We'll be back again next week with another new conversation. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.